Centric Lunch and Learn. Got a good crowd, man. You turn up for you, too. Uh, we got some people on the phone, it sounds like. Uh, Mike Didry, you here? I am. I'll tell the people on the phone what's an uh, important thing to know. Yes, if you would, before putting your, your phones on, uh, on hold, because what we're here is the background marketing campaign for the company. And it uh, certainly. Uh, uh, fascinating. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it is fascinating. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. Thanks. But it won't be on topic. So, <laughs> so uh, we've been doing these lunch and learns. I was thinking about how these these different things connect. Um, obviously, it's a development opportunity. We're talking about customer centric. Y'all know. Hopefully, you know or remember that uh, uh, customer centric was one of our, or is one of our 2018 strategic initiatives or strategic priorities. Customer centric is not one of our 2019 strategic priorities. Anybody, uh, anybody have a problem with that? <laughs> anybody concerned with that? We're going to still keep it a priority. Anybody remember? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Nicole. What? We're going to still keep it a priority. It's still a priority. It's more than a priority. Development is uh, it's in our purpose, right? To develop great people. Why? Big challenges, challenges for our customers. So, um, here's another question for you. Customer centric, anybody remember what customer centric is? Some words to help uh, describe customer centric? It's our A word. You can use the A word for this. Anticipating. Anticipating what? Customer needs. Customer needs. So customer centric is all about anticipating the needs of our customers. Um, last question, I think. Who has a map in their car that's not on your phone? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have a map? In the glove compartment, I'm not looking. Who's the youngest person here? It's gotta be Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Uh, <laughs> you ever been on a road trip, Jeremiah, <laughs> and had a, a like a, a, a paper map, a book, an atlas? Ever experienced that in your life? Yeah, when you were going on vacation. When you were little? Yeah. yeah. How about when you were driving? Since you've been driving, have you ever used a paper map? <laughs> Would you know where to get one if you decided you were on a road trip and you needed a map? No. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> maps are no longer uh, provided to us in the way that they were right now. We, we just pull up our phone and we don't even have to look at it. It tells us where to go. So uh, if you are in the business of making maps and you had the best maps in the world and you had, your customers are telling you that those maps were great, but you weren't anticipating uh, changes in technology, you weren't anticipating the needs uh, of, of your customers, you weren't thinking about improvement, you would probably be in a bind right now. All you making paper maps, and I bet you there's some companies that aren't fine. So you think about the things that we're connecting there. 2019, technology is one of our, our initiatives. Uh, we talked about development that's going on today. Think about anticipating the needs of our customers. Uh, improvement, service to our customers. So those are all important, and, and it's what we're, we're talking about today. So we're, we're doing something a little bit outside of the box. We've got Jonathan Terrell here, JT, just going to talk about uh, some things that he does and thinks about with respect to to be customer centric. JT is uh, a former Nichols football player, a former coach, coach with some of the guys around here at Vanderbilt and Nichols with Brother Martin, if I get that right. And now he sells drugs at uh, <laughs> Brother Levin. That's all legal. And it's all legal. <laughs> 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 FBI so JT, we appreciate you coming to share with us. Uh, thanks for being here. Floor to us. So thank y'all, and I appreciate it, Paul. Melody, so that's even better. <laughs> Make up a name, Ray. Mark, if you like, Coach Red. So uh, anyway, thanks. And uh, so just real quick, uh, I am uh, 20 year in the industry of talking to people. So uh, my first eight or nine years was coaching, uh, where we made a difference in kids' life. Um, Ray said something to me last week, uh, a couple of days ago, that made so much sense. So I live my life by this model of customer centric. Um, it's not about you, it's about the customer. Uh, no matter if you're recruiting, if you're in the oil field, if you're selling pipe, no matter what you're doing, that's what it's about. It's about the customer. 
So um, I talk about the first uh, few years that I uh, coached. Um, I talk about a kid that I coached uh, at Nickel State who didn't have any confidence in himself. And um, the one thing at quarterback is you got to be the leader. You got to be the confidence guy. You got to be the one that everybody looks at. And so um, he was backing up a guy by the name of Josh Sun for uh, many years and had the opportunity to go behind Josh. And uh, the one thing that I thought was very, very important was the simple fact of understanding what his problems were. So he had all the tools, but there was a problem, and the problem was his confidence, and how could I help make a difference in that? Um, not pat myself on the back because I had no athletic ability like he had, but he became player of the year in uh, 2005 as the Nichols won their conference championship, but it was our relationship, and I centered everything around him. So um, the three things that I want to talk about, and I left you some little note cards, so you can have three takeaways. If you have three takeaways, write them down. If you have uh, some questions, you can put them on the paper, and I'll pick them up and email it to Ray for some <laughs> So um, the, one, the number one thing is people don't care what you say until they know that you care period, until they know that you're sincere. So they don't care what you say, they don't care what you're selling, they don't care anything about that until they know that you care, whether it's about the patient, the student, the customer, Shell, BP, no matter what, until they realize that it's not about you. So I say that all the time, people buy from people they like, they trust, and who they believe that bring them value. So I sell right now uh, a life vest. It's a wearable cardiac defibrillator. Um, the life vest is a shock box that you wear on the outside. Most people get them implanted, but the, the life vest had a little gap where there's a wait time before you get an implantable device that you put on uh, this life vest for 30 to 90 days. For the first year, or the first two years of me selling the life vest, I sold the life vest based on it saved lives. I had no idea what the customer truly needed. All I knew is that my life vest saved lives. It shocked people who went into arrhythmias. It brought them back to life. It was a 96% chance and we had uh, no competition. So that was pretty easy, <laughs> I thought. But what I didn't understand is that when you speak to a cardiologist, there's way so much, there's so much more <coughs> to understand other than just an arrhythmia and a shock box. So they're dealing with heart failure. They're dealing with AFib, VFib, VTAC, all of that is just terms for arrhythmias, um, heart attacks, cholesterol, diabetes. Once I dove in to understand true, the true understanding of what they're doing, of what they're treating, and becoming a part of their team, the third year, I was the number one sales rep in the country. But it changed everything when I became a part of the team and made it about them and not about me. So the first year, I was just trying to reach my goal. I was trying to hit my goal, make bonus, make plan, keep people off my back. The third year, I had to reinvent who I was. And the, the way I did that was by diving in to understand who the customers were, what their problems were. You are problem solvers. That's who you are. You dive into the problem space of the customer. So whatever that space may be, you find out the problem, you become the problem solver, you fix it. So um, I have stories that I tell later about Rafe and I uh, in form of sales. But um, I talk about that problem space because if you don't understand what the true problem is, they're gonna give you, you know we talked about people like people buy from people they like, trust, and, and value, bring value, they're gonna give you this much. Even as a friend, they'll give you that much. No matter how much they like you, if you just ask for that much, that's what they're gonna give you. If you start to understand and make them the center of everything you do, they'll call you even before the problem gets big. And it might not even be about your product, it might be about the simple fact that I don't know if y'all saw this is tape, so I don't think I can say it. <laughs> so there was a, a sportscaster, I don't have to say her name, who wore our device. She's on Fox, and everybody saw it. There it is. 
So everybody saw it. Um, and um, the big deal was that she went out and just started talking about our device. Um, that physician who spoke to my partner who ended up doing the device, we talked about customer centric at that time. He ended up getting her on a medication that helped her heart failure. So even if our product still became on board, but even because it wasn't about us and they trusted him that much, that they used him to help get something else done. Customer centric is when you become truly part of the team. So um, one, just always know that it's not about you. Sometimes that's hard for me, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, team is everything. It's the second thing I wanna talk about. So no matter what position you hold within the company, you're a part of the customer-centric focus. Uh, for you guys, it could be marketing, it could be sales analysis. For me, it is marketing. Uh, we have what we call territory managers, which I am one of those. Um, I have a sales support rep. I have a patient service representative. All of those people, you make one team, one goal, but they're an extension of me. So, um, I always talk about the simple fact that when I call into home office, people say I get uh, treated better than others. But when I call into home office, again, it's not about me. So this girl who I call has six other team members. Um, so when I call, I don't call with a problem. I usually call with a solution to my problem to see if it'll work. So um, she entails, helps me tells me if it's okay, I can do this, or if I can't. But the big deal is, is that she feels like she's part of the, of the circle. So she feels like she's helping that customer as well. So um, no matter what part of the team you play, um, I know marketing for, for me, they listen when I call in and say, hey, this piece probably should say this. To, can you tell me why it says this? And they might have a very good reason of why it says that. And um, you know, we can communicate, go back and forth because I'm on the ground. I see things a little bit different. They see it from a whole analytical uh, vibe. So anyway, just becoming one, one team, one goal. I think that is so, so very, very important. Um, I always talk about uh, leaving no, nobody behind. So for salespeople, uh, as myself, and uh, when you walk into an office, uh, I was training somebody not long ago and she walked in, asked to speak to the doctor, to the receptionist. She didn't say good morning, hello. She just said, is doctor such and such in? Said yes, we waited, saw the doctor, left. So our, we always talk about full office calls or um, inviting everybody within the office. Um, you guys have a receptionist. She's hardcore, boy, you get that. <laughs> anyway, and, uh, <laughs> so, um, I just know that every time that I walk in somewhere, that they're just as important as seeing the physician. So I always talk about not leaving anybody out. Um, that part is customer centric too, because I, I tell a story of, uh, there was a janitor at West Jefferson Medical Center, and I dap him up every day, every time I see him. I mean, he is just the nicest guy. So I was getting ready to go to the sixth floor, and he says to me, he goes, J JT, where are you going? And I said, oh, I'm go and see uh, Dr. McKinney. And he said, oh, Dr. McKinney just went to the cash lab, which is on the other side of the hospital. Don't waste your time going there. He just left, he might be on. So there was so much information and I didn't waste time all because that I treat him just as if he was a nurse or a physician. So I always talk, and you know, it's the way I live, it's who I am, um, everybody else, could be just a little bit different, but if you start to realize that it's not about you, it can always be put in play. Uh, I talk about, um, probably about 10 years ago, uh, I guess it really stuck with me. I was uh, in church, and um, I, I didn't go to church only 10 years ago. I mean, I to church. <laughs> but anyway, um, I was in church, and, uh, and the preacher was talking, he was talking about putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. And when he was talking about that, I was taking it literal. And um, I started to do that as I walked this journey through sales of what that patient or uh, that person might be going through, the patient might be going through, the receptionist might be going through, the nurses who have 20 different people calling them all the time. 
So all of that stuff makes a difference. So one team, one goal, when you become part of a team, and I, that's within the business, that's without the, you know, outside of the business, um, that's, that's what, what I think drives it home. Um, so what does success look like for me as a customer, uh, for being customer centric? Um, I think when customers started calling me with the problems, I felt like I was winning. When they would call me and say, hey, we're about to have a case. This patient's EF is 35. Do you think you can make it here? Not sure if we're gonna put a life vest on them, but tell us that's a great laugh when they ask me to read scripts. So uh, I'm a football coach. <laughs> but uh, when they ask me to read the strips and go, you know what, this, is, this run is 30 seconds long, we probably ought to put a life vest on. When they started to do that, I started to, I started to feel like I was, I was truly winning. Um, so a, a, a few stories, we talk about uh, people buy from people they like, um, who they trust and who they think bring value. So uh, if you think about this, think about um, getting stopped by a cop. If he's your friend, are you gonna get a ticket? Probably not. And you probably won't because he likes you, right? So me and Rafe shared that with this talk a couple days ago and I thought that was a funny story. So um, recruiting, when you're talking about people buy from people they like and they trust. Um, so I recruited a kid out of Ascension Catholic. <clears throat> he had three schools to pick from, Northeast Louisiana, Nickel State University or McNeese State. Um, not even thinking about this because that wasn't even in my vocabulary at the time, customer centric. But when I started to think about stories, I started to think about this one. And uh, I remember recruiting the kid and the customer was his mom. The customer wasn't him. So I recruited his mom and her concerns were, I didn't want him to go far, so Northeast was out. I was making that niece like 20 hours away. <laughs> but uh, so didn't want him to go far. Northeast was out. Um, he went to Ascension Catholic, small environment. Magnese got like 20,000 students, whether they got it or not. So, <laughs> but anyway, you start painting the picture, and I started to just feel her, feel her problems. I just started solving them. We have a small campus. We're family oriented. All of this stuff that we brought to, to Nickel State, and he ended up being an uh, all-conference player, and people would say, how did you steal him? And I said, I recruited his mom, I figured out what her problems were, and we solved them. So just one story of customer-centric in, in a whole different life. Um, Yel Vinoy, uh, Yel Vinoy was the kid I was just talking about who um, backed up uh, Josh Sun, and I told you that story, how he became uh, player of the year in the conference. And uh, what I told you guys is what Yale Vinoy said about me at um, his Hall of Fame day. And the things that he said, I didn't even know I did. So, um, you know, the confidence deal, believing in him, giving him something that he didn't quite have, trying to solve his problems because you're a problem solver, right? That's what you do. You solve problems, you figure the problems out, you enter that space. I didn't know that's what I was doing, but that's what I did. And to hear the kid say it, I went, I'm gonna tell that story one day. Because I didn't, I would never tell it because I just thought that I was doing what was right. Um, so uh, here's a, a Rafe and I story, and I'm gonna shut up. So Rafe and I was in New Iberia. Uh, this doc is very, very hard to see. Uh, we are, teaming up to go and talk to this guy. And the one thing that I know for sure is he is not easy to see. The gatekeeper is tough. And me and Rafe kept going and going. And we finally got a lunch. And um, one of our lunches, uh, we're sitting down, we're talking to the, uh, the nurses and the doctors coming in. I put my hand on the table, spilled every bit of salad on my brand new suit from here. <laughs> Yeah, did I not? All the way, all the way down, I'm full of, um, I don't know, I think it was, it was probably olive oil and all kinds of stuff. And that was an icebreaker. 
But anyway, <laughs> uh, so um, we start talking to this guy and start to figure out um, his needs. We still, we still diabetic pills at the time. And start to figure out, figure out his needs and other people couldn't get into that office. Um, so the difference became, you're talking about customer centric is when Rafe and I was back in that office sitting down discussing some, some stuff and the doctor walks out and he goes, hey, I'm ready to see you guys. And we tell him, hold on one second. To the doctor who is the hardest guy to see, we put him on hold so we can make sure that when we presented that we were on point. So that was customer centric. That's just some of the stuff that Rafe and I do and I'm gonna leave you with this and then I'm gonna sit down uh, when you make the customer the center of your business plan, you win. Don't make them the end result. Don't make them about the bonus. Don't make them about uh, reaching goal. Don't make them about anything else other than when you make them the center of your business plan, customer-centric comes automatically. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you got me, Mark. Anybody else got a question? Anybody write anything down, take away? I wrote a few things down. Um, yeah. What you got, Mike? I uh, really like the problem space of customer. We put them in that space. I like that a lot. And I like to got to ask questions to figure out what their problems are, right? And how they can answer. Any solution for the problem? Don't bring the problem and have a solution. Yeah. So we ask questions, figure out what the problems are. Come with a solution. That's good. What else? Be part of the team, no matter the role. Part of the team. That's awesome. Thought. Uh, he kind of said something that I we had talked about during the sales ops meeting in a different way, uh, talking about not focusing on the outcome of something. He kind of mentioned that at the end and throughout the talk about not let's not focus on our customers as an outcome. Let's focus on the things that get us to that outcome center of that. So and I thought that was something we had talked about a little bit during our sales, a lot during our sales ops meeting, kind of yeah. go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, part of that team, just, just the way JT talking about bringing the, bringing the team together, getting everybody on board, treating people with respect, not just a customer, but those that are, that are on the team with you, that's good stuff. I, I meant to say, by the way, that JT is, a, is very successful at what he does. It sort of builds some credibility for him, but you know, I don't think I, you know, I left that out, but it's obvious, right? Just the, the way uh, JT thinks, communicates. So we appreciate you sharing that with us. That's good. So we, we, we connected that. By the way, uh, the story about the, uh, the, the cop with a friend not giving you a ticket, most of y'all heard this story. I had a, a guy who gave me a ticket and then asked me for a job after. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't yeah, how, to how did that, that work out? Yeah. <laughs> Y'all heard the story, maybe some of y'all, about the, 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 the person that they, um, the T, uh, what do you call them, TSA agents at the, at the airport who asked me for a job. Well, believe it or not, this last trip I was going to Houston, I go through the thing, a guy looks at my license, he says, oh, Dan Ops, that's, the, that's like the, the company Dan Ops, exactly like the other guy who, if you remember and heard the story, didn't proceed to ask me for a job. This guy says, oh, and I say, yeah. Because last time I was nervous, I thought I was gonna ask somebody to ask for a job. He says, uh, he says, I applied for a job with y'all. I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's the same <laughs> Go stand over there, let me check it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got you. Uh, okay, we got Josh Gidron next. So Josh is gonna, gonna, you know, keep us on the same theme about customer centric, making the customer the, cent uh, the center of what we do. Josh. Uh, uh, Josh has a lot of credibility as well. Josh has been with us for 20, 21 years, over 21 years. He started when he was like 16 and uh, been with us for a long time, serving Chevron pretty much that whole time, right? We've had a lot of success with Chevron during that time. A lot of that uh, 
uh, due to Josh's hard work and the, and the team that's been supporting him. So, uh, Josh, tell us about the customer centric at Chevron and how that works for us. When we talk about customer centric, it's a lot of things that we do um, just as, as a part of our job. We always think about you know, when we're working on reports or talking to our customers, it's something that we, it's what we're paid to do. You know, it's our, our career. Uh, what I want to ask is, uh, why is it important to know our customers and know exactly what they want? You know, who are our customers? Does anybody in here know who are our top five um, customers by headcount? Oh, no. Uh, not by revenue. By revenue. <laughs> 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 Chevron number one. Chevron was number one for many years. Uh, no, number one, Fieldwood. Just to uh, yeah. surpass uh, Chevron. <laughs> you know, so, and how long have we, we've been working with that company? Do you know? Anybody? Actually, a few years. Yeah. About four or five years. Um, so, you know, that's a customer that comes that's, that's come to us uh, because of. Customer centric company. Uh, number two uh, on that list, Shell. Been with them for 47 years. There's a reason they stay these year, all these years and work uh, with Dan also these things, followed by BP, Chevron, and then uh, Anadarko. Who makes the call? Is, it a run, is the company run by operations or are they run by our supply chain department? And we'll go and a little further, we'll get into that on why this makes a big difference. <coughs> and then what are KPIs? KPIs are key performance indicators. These are things that are measuring how we do as a, uh, as a customer to our customers. Some of our past KPIs included stats, not only on the Danos level, but on the customer specific level. This one breaks down our safety stats uh, through our, our different divisions that we report out uh, to the customer. <coughs> Over the years, we, we uh, track our historical data all the way from uh, near misses to uh, first aids to watch cards to all the different things that are tallied in uh, based off of a specific customer. An overview dashboard for our, most of our operating, uh, for operations shows where our employees work at. This is a snapshot of one of the past KPIs working for Chevron, given the different headcount and the different uh, divisions that are all within uh, Chevron. On the bottom, there's a historical data over the numbers of, that we've changed over the past year. Retention. Why is retention a big, a big uh, uh, thing to cover? Employee turnover is a huge thing when it comes to making sure we send in the right people, the quality of the person, uh, different things like that. And if you look at the, this chart at the bottom, you go from 2005 to 2017, from a 25 to 30, 33% turnover ratio, to all the way down to the, the teens and then down to nine and eight percent. Um, a lot of this has contributed this trend, a downward trend of turnover, reducing this mainly because we speak the same language our customers. You know, we understand what they need. We're finding out those things, that, those questions, those problems that they have, and offering the solutions and, and uh, coordinating their things and with them. Over the years, things go from operations can control to supply chain, as we talked about earlier, now that the supply chain comes in, they're a little more analytical, right? They want more data. They, uh, those KPIs that we had, all these huge presentations with charts and flows, everything looking nice, uh, have shrunk down to specific numbers. This is a scorecard for, for Chevron, uh, which we used this past year, showing the different uh, things that are measured from safety, to reliability, to turnover, cost savings, and even uh, catalog usage. Why would that be a, uh, something we uh, they would want to track? Anybody? As far as catalog usage, we're using making sure we're using the correct rates. It's not something in catalog items, not uh, overcharging something that's been agreed upon, uh, different things like that. They want to make sure everything's flowing and running in the same uh, manner. Understanding our customer. Over here, we, do, we had a breakdown on why, uh, what exactly goes on with Chevron and what the KPIs are involved to. You know, what do we do well for our customer? We want to find out what we're doing well and use that as our strengths whenever we're working on things, to, whether it's customer sourcing, customer uh, uh, project builds, different things like that. 
what do we do to provide value added? Identifying our threats, not only threats uh, based on our competition, <coughs> but threats within our customer uh, mainframe. You know, who's making those decisions? Who are the key players? And what does our uh, customer truly care about? Is there a difference between customer service and customer experience? We talked earlier about customer service, but is there a true difference? Does anybody think that it's, uh, it's one and the same, or is it it's all one? It's a little different. When I look at customer service, I think of reactive, right? You have an issue. Um, they, they call in, uh, you have a, have a problem, you hurry up and try and resolve it. Customer experience is a proactive way. Right, that's going out there and providing something on the front end. When I, uh, customer service, I give an example. Uh, you call in, you have a problem. You, uh, Hello, this is AT and T. How can I help you? Do you have a case number? Um, thank you. You know, can what do we serve? Everything you you uh, had a question on today? Uh, please fill out the survey after the call. You know, everybody gets those calls, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, you look at the bottom. Being reactive, a customer service, the client's upset, you handled it, you, uh, you, uh, and then you solve it. Great, everybody has to start off with have, having great customer uh, service. But to, gra to graduate over the customer experience is to, to move on to that next level. You know, you look at customer experience as uh, companies such as Amazon, uh, Google. Amazon, they track on different things you order and then they start fill in your inbox with different things, uh, you know, uh, to purchase. Uh, Google, you know, they track your search engine, things like that. You go into an uh, Apple store, anybody been into Apple store? You know, is it a little different from walking into Apple or Walmart? <laughs> it's, a little, it's just a little different, right? You walk into Apple store, they actually want to talk to you. They see how you're doing, they, they try and just walk through. There's no big line or cash register that you have to wait behind 20 people. They take care of what you need and, and they go forward from it. Why do you shop, eat, or watch at certain things? Why do you go to that fast food store? Why do you go to a certain place to go shopping for your clothes? All these things are broken down into a few different categories. When you think about why do you go to McDonald's? Because they're fast. You're not going over there because it's quality meat. Right? <laughs> uh, why do you go, why do you buy at Walmart? Because it's cheap. It's pretty much you're gonna find it there, it's gonna be cheap, it's gonna provide what you need. When you think of buying something from Tiff Tiffany and Company, do you think it's gonna be cheap? No, it's gonna be luxury. And that's the market they want. They wanna know, they wanna show you that this is what we're selling. You know, Amazon, customer, uh, user friendly. You can go out there and purchase anything by just clicking a button. So you're very user friendly. Does Amazon make anything? They just sell things. Chick-fil-A, one of the best customer service. Now I'm gonna have a little exercise. We're gonna go through the different departments and try and see what, <coughs> the, what is your, your department currently doing or what it can do based off of this little model. These, these things here. You know, information technology, we have some lot of information technology. What, what are some of the things that, that may tie in with something that you're doing for our customers? So, I mean, the big thing can be growing up with technology. It makes these things easier for people to use, um, stuff like that. Just making it more fluid, the process that they have to go through. So, definitely. How about payroll? As far as payroll, you know, they need to make sure things are put out fast and quickly out there. You need to be user friendly. You know, we, we just, whenever we're having somebody worry about their pay, that's a, a big issue when it comes to our employees and then it becomes a problem with our customers if they're upset with it also. Human resources, anyone human resources, but whether it's recruiting or uh, human resources. Recruiting, we have to be fast, right? Customer service. is probably a cut between quality Getting those quality guys because you have to vet through the employees. You have to 
make sure you have the right people that keeps that turnover down that we talked about earlier, but also, you know, getting it out in a timely manner. AR and AP. Anybody? Yeah. Um, we have more so in getting the products out there in a timely manner, the quality invoicing, and we try to use user friendly processes as far as how we get approvals on things. And we also deal with internal customers as well as our external customers, with our intern being our operation guys, account managers, project coordinators, trying to get everything done so that way the end result to the Chevron Shell BP is met. Safety. sets us apart are some of the structural components of safety that, that are different because we're not as comfortable as a lot of our competitors are, right? We don't, we don't slip into the model of comfortability, so that allows us to be more flexible, and I think that, that inherently creates better trustworthiness as well, so. Perfect. Training. So from a training standpoint, um, I think the main things we focus on would be customer service, uh, fast, obviously, user friendly, and quality. I mean, our customers expect quality. The training that we provide, um, our, uh, our employees expect user friendly processes and training and, and whatnot. It all kind of ties together. Good. And also marketing. Yeah, so um, when I look at the pie chart, I think quality, right? We want our brand to represent quality. And so all our marketing. <coughs> user-friendly, when you think about accessing the website, doing that, people need to be able to navigate that, find out the information about the company. Mm -hmm. And it goes on from there, so the customer engagement with presentations and making sure our messaging is addressing their pain points, their issues, and we're offering solutions to those interactions. We're gonna do a little exercise. Does it, raise your hand if you're going to Disney before Disney World. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to uh, think back, put yourself in that place, and one of those with Magic Kingdom, uh, Epcot, uh, Animal Kingdom, whatever it is, just think about it, where you, what you're uh, doing right there, and what was one thing, and one thing that impressed you, something that really stood out in the Clean. Attention to detail. Attention to detail. Customer service. Customer service. Made you feel special. Made you feel special. <laughs> Um, Definitely not bad. And <laughs> <laughs> all those things are awesome. They're great, great answers. Um, but it's kind of odd, you know, all those answers, right? What's the one thing we didn't even talk about? The rides, right? I mean, if you are Disney, what are you doing? Waiting in line. They're about rides. <laughs> Anybody know which one this is? Tower of Terror. Tower of Terror. Uh, this ride. Takes you 13 stories up, right? <laughs> then it drops you all the way to the bottom. And then all of a sudden it brings you back up again to, to drop you again. I mean, why are we doing it? It's crazy. Okay. But we, we talked about rides. Um, and all these, uh, we talked about cleanliness and everything, but all that, and we didn't talk about rides, but this ride costs over $100 million to build. Disney is not in the uh, in the price or in the in the in the ballpark of selling you ride tickets. They're about selling you an experience, mm -hmm. okay? And all those things, the cleanliness, the organized, the make you feel special, uh, all those things are what what they do to make you want to go back again. It's not about the hundred million dollar ride that they just put you through. Uh, it's about that experience and remembering the different things. Not saying no, finding a way to say yes, even though you're you are saying no, finding <laughs> solutions with customers, providing alternatives, and not being a dead end on their journey. Uh, one thing I've always thought about when grow, growing through all the 21 years working for Dan Oss uh, and handling and working with Chevron, I've uh, I could really count on my hand how many times I may have said no on certain things. 
Does saying no mean you're saying yes to everything? Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that. It's about finding an alternative to not to not be that dead end on their question. And one thing that brings me back to Disney, and I like to talk about this, is uh, one time we were sitting down for a parade, waiting for the night parade um, at Chevron, at uh, Disney, and <laughs> we found <laughs> uh, And you know, after a long day at Disney, we get there right before it starts, and you're sitting there. Um, I wanted to get a little rest, so I was like, man, let's go sit down. We got the kids, you know, they kind kind of worn out. Let's go sit on the curb and we'll wait for the parade. We got a good spot. And we sat next to a place and it was real tall, like right on the side of us. And they had a, one of the Disney, they call them cast members, right? They don't call them employees. And this one lady was there to keep the reserve section for everybody else. And the time, it was 45 minutes until the, the parade was supposed to start. And throughout the whole 45 minutes, she never said no to anybody. Now, if you had people walking in, and saying, hey, can I, you know, can I sit right here? And I said, well, well, this is a reserve section, but you see that lady over there in the ridge? They have a seat right around that corner uh, that you could go and sit, sit by. You know, and the other person would come, hey, can I sit right here? Oh, I'm sorry, this is reserve section, but they do have one. If you turn this corner around the street, they have some more seating on this. And, you know, it's about finding that other solution for them without having to come out and say, no, they can't do that, right? Mastering the art of never saying no. There's always a way to explain and find a way to say yes. The key point is that we need to move from a task mentality to experience mentality. When you think about it, it's not about us providing, you know, sending out that operator or that welder or whatever it is to the customer. It's about sending that person, but also making sure all his customer needs are, are met, whether it's the internal, the, the uh, the Daniels employee, or the external, the Chevron, or BP, or Shell customer that takes care of it. At the end of the day, we offer, what we offer is not very different from everybody else, right? We, we offer production operators, we, we vet through them, we get quality guys, but it's not very different from the other guys that are out there, because we're recruiting those guys too. But what, what they can uh, take away, and what makes us stand apart is the experience that the customer has when they're dealing with it. So my daughter worked at Disney. They are not allowed to say no. <laughs> no. If I ask, to say no yeah. to that. Will. Ask for a refill of a drink, and you know you can't get them. <laughs> they will not say no. So I was with, we were with her. <laughs> no. We were with her, and she said, and I, she said, it's all about how you ask, right? And she said, you can't say no. And I said, what are you talking about? And there was a guy over there, he was having a fit about a refill. And she said, now watch this. And there was another guy that walked up and he said, um, my daughter's right here, I just wanna get a refill of Sprite, you don't have to fill it all the way. And the lady was like, sure, filled it. I mean, somebody was having a heart attack about it because he paid so much to get in, but they can't. She just said, you gotta try to redirect and then you just end up giving it to him. So there y'all go your tip for getting the free thing just get up. <laughs> policy we're not going to say no and then they think about and I imagine that they role play and say what if a customer comes to us with this how do we respond what's an appropriate redirection that we can do so 
because we were thinking about in our own areas about where we would feel the impulse to say no and then how we could redirect. That's awesome. Uh, redirect. Find a smoke screen. The redirect. We're still trying to solve that problem, right? Sometimes politicians are more of a smoke screen, right? <laughs> <laughs> we want to answer, we want to solve the problem. We just got to get creative. I like how Josh uh, showed us the comparison between companies and who they want to target. Like, so Tiffany's is not going to go after the women who pay for costume jewelry. You know, they're not going to go after. They're going to go after a certain uh, group of people, just like Lexus and Toyota. Like, that's totally different marketing campaigns. And as a consumer, we appreciate. Like, I'm not going to go to. Cristiano's are like, you know, a nicer restaurant if I think it's ridiculous to pay more than $5 for a meal, you know, because somebody might value lower prices, but somebody might value a great experience. And you don't care how much you're paying for it because you want to go there for good service and good food. Obviously not the reason you'd go to McDonald's, but, um, you know, it's as a consumer, <laughs> They're kind of sifting that for you, for what matters to you, because you know you can have all of these things that you offer customers, but why does it matter, and why did why did they why should they care about it? And so, some people will only be Lexus customers because they like paying, they pay more, they like the service they get, and hey, I love that. It all goes back. What our strategy is, how we tie that in. We can't be all things to, to all customers. We do some. We do a lot of work on the on the upfront building beauty design to sort of take new customers that, that align with us and that, that want to buy, you know, what we're selling. Um, we just can't necessarily sell again everything to everybody. But you said you repeated a word that Josh used that I wrote, that I wrote down was experience. You know, from customer service to customer experience. How do we um, get more proactive instead of reactive? How do we create something in somebody's mind that when they think about Danos, um, they, they think, man, that, that was an experience I never had. That's the kind of customer service that I'm looking looking for. Um, what else? I think a good example off of that is kind of how we were able to connect Steelwood. Steelwood was a, a company that used to use, I mean, they still do, but use people for their, because they know them, brother law that value to other customers and folks wake up to, to you know, or, or notice when you come knocking in your door. It's pretty cool when that happens. Especially when you're sitting on the beach on vacation and it calls you. <laughs> Which is what happens. Um, anything else? So Mike, who's your customer? Mark, who's your customer? I think my biggest success that kind of is the, like you guys were saying with experience and stuff like that and I think one of my biggest keys to success in recruiting is the fact that I am personal with everyone I don't I have a policy where I don't let anyone no matter if they're a cashier at Phillips 66 I don't go three hours without touching base whether it be a text an email or a phone call and I that way they know that I'm interested and I am who I am and a lot of times where 
I'll be talking to someone and they say, hey man, I got my son or my cousin that, you know, he's looking. I don't say no or I don't have a spot. I call the son, I talk to him for an hour, and then that inadvertently gets in two candidates that we hired on just because I took 30 minutes out of my day to talk to his son. So I think the biggest thing is just being aware that the personability and the social interaction with people is the most important. That's great, and what you what you're describing is customer service to the people that you recruit. So I just wanted us to, to step back and not just think about Chevron and Fieldwood and BP, because our customers those those are the customers that, that pay our bills. But our employees that are on the field, the the, the um, customers inside the company that we serve with different departments. So we can we can have that same approach around customer centric and customer thinking and problem solving, and not saying no, and creating an experience. And, Should have it there too. Anybody else? You, uh, thanks for sharing your example. Anybody else have an example of how you are serving your customer, be it uh, one of our external customers or an internal customer that you want to share with us? Matt? So, um, my, I guess, big customer would be Shell, right? Mm -hmm. When I break it down, I look at each individual platform. So, Olympus is my customer. I look at Augur is more of my customer. And it's a lot of something that JT touched on was just about respect and experience that I actually had on Augur. I went offshore Monday through Wednesday. So I treat or I try to treat the quote unquote lowest position just as all the way to the highest position. So on the offshore asset, Gallaghan would probably be one of the lowest positions, right? So this situation happened. I'm sitting there eating lunch and one of the Gallaghans is trying to restock the bubble gum on the shelf. Well, he accidentally knocked it down on the ground. Bubble gum goes all over the place. So I'm throwing away my plate and food, and I kind of looked back and saw that it had scattered all over the place. Well, two guys walk out and said, man, you knocked it down again, huh? Kept walking. I said, it didn't sit too well with me, and I was like, I had my Dan on shirt on at the time, and I'm thinking this is a great way to be a customer representative of me, customer-centric, but also be that person showing respect to everybody. So I sit down and I'm helping him pick up the bubble gum. Two more guys walk past. I'm like, man, knock that on the ground. So here's four people who thought, you know what, I'm better than that guy right there. But we shouldn't be like that. We should be treating everybody with respect and helping them out. And I know that went away with the long uh, with that guy right there. And then on the flip side, at the end of the day, I'm sitting in Mr. Patrick Hicks' office, he's the customer. And just that sincerity and treating them how they want to be treated and not, I guess, put them up on the pedestal. Uh, hopefully, I don't get mad, but I was in tennis shoes, blue jeans, and a t shirt, sitting in his office just discussing business. And I think that went a long way with Patrick Hicks because although I do have that respect for him, I treated him just like I would anybody else. And we actually had a long conversation, and he wound up taking my contact details because he's about to fill some more positions. Awesome. Anybody else? Yeah, I have something, uh, something JT had mentioned earlier. Uh, it made me think about something uh, over the years, many years of working, uh, uh, 21 years with Dan Off with Chevron, and you see a lot of people move from different places, from uh, whether they start into maybe a galley uh, hand position or a uh, role of operator to become an OS, OIM, or even uh, operations manager. So uh, you never know where that person's gonna be at three years from now, four years from now, 10 years from now, or 21 years from now. Uh, it's all about making that experience uh, the first time. There's only one uh, chance to make a first impression with that person. Um, I, I remember uh, always uh, being friendly with uh, somebody that wasn't really an operations manager role. They kind of had their own thing on the side. There was a, a lower level in the safety side, and I always made sure to talk to him every time I saw him. And uh, you know, I was even told, oh, are you having lunch with that guy or whatever, uh, but he was the one that, that eventually got me uh, to meet with a lot more people because of his contacts that he had himself. So it's all about working the angles and making sure you uh, treat everybody well. Awesome. Uh, 
Well, this is great. Thanks for the engagement, the dialogue. Um, what I would encourage you all to do is to do what uh, JT suggested, write a couple of things down, a couple of takeaways that you learned today about how to provide better customer service, a better customer experience to be more customer-centric. Uh, this is a great development opportunity. I think we all got our minds a little bit more around what, what it means to be customer-centric because at the end of the day, we can have the best strategy, we can have the smartest people, we can have the nicest building, can have all these great things but if it's not about the customer in the center of what we do and understanding who they are what they need what their problems are anticipating those things we won't be successful in the long term so um, go team mm -hmm. and thank, you, thank you for preparing and doing a great job of uh, delivering this JT thanks for taking some time out of your busy day to come hang out with us and uh, inspire us with us, so really appreciate you guys.